Thank you very much, Sangavelu. C can everybody hear me? Yes, okay, good. So, of course, first of all, I want to thank the organizers uh, because I'm really happy to be in this country and in this place. This is a really beautiful facility. And uh, I'm sure this will be a great conference. Thank you very much. So, um, this talk kind of takes, starts where Diogo left off. Uh, we will be talking about Fourier joint restriction estimates, which is something we have saw, we have seen, and also this rarely maximized phenomenon, which Diogo briefly mentioned. Now let's go to, let's go uh, further down that line, okay? Let's start. Okay, so all this talk will be about this inequality. This is, of course, this is a conjectural inequality. Uh, you know, this is a famous restriction conjecture in the case of the cone. What is the cone? Actually, in the title, I wrote cones because there's actually two kinds of cones. This, this is the, the natural one. This is an algebraic surface. Uh, yeah, by the way, I'm using this convention. Tau is a, a real number, is a, co a one dimensional coordinate which we think as time, and xi is a vector, a d-dimensional vector. Okay, so uh, tau square equals mod c square is a natural algebraic surface, which looks like this. This is called a two-sheeted cone. And then we will also consider this, uh, uh, the, this surface by, by chopped enough. Okay, so you just remove the lower part. You take the one-sheeted cone. And on each, each one of these surfaces, you put a measure. This is the measure that you put on the two-sheeted cone. So this is defined, this is a delta function. It's not a function as, as we all know, but let's pretend it is. And uh, uh, th this is actually a, a very concise way of writing the essentially unique measure that is invariant under all transformations of space-time. I'm going to refer to this as space-time, right? So tau xi is space-time. Good. So if you have um, this measure is invariant under all transformations of space-time that preserve this quadratic. And these are the Lorentz transformations. Okay. So this is a, a, a compact way of writing the essentially unique measure that is Lorentz invariant. It's, it's not exactly the surface measure of the cone. It's, uh, it's a bit different, but it's the most natural measure you can put here. And we will see that this is really the measure we need to consider. The cone is tied to the wave equation. The wave equation is Lorentz invariant. We want to preserve Lorentz. Uh, Lord, this Lorentz invariant. Okay. And this is, of course, on the one sheeted cone, what you do, you just chop it, you just remove the lower part. Okay. So we have a surface, we have a measure on it, we can consider the extension operator, which Diogo told, uh, as Diogo explained, is the adjoint of the restriction operator. This is why this is called restriction conjecture, even though there's no restriction here. And uh, it is conjectured that this inequality holds in this range of exponents. For, for this talk, this range is not going to be very, but let's remember that there is a range here. So in particular, we have two parameters. One is the dimension of space, and the other is, is P. P is the exponent here, okay? And the problem is, this is the problem of sharp Fourier restriction theory, is what are the maximizers of this ratio? So suppose that we know that the estimate holds. So that there is a finite constant here. And so this ratio makes sense. Otherwise this could be infinity and there's nothing. Suppose we know that this ratio makes sense. What is the maximum of this ratio? And even more interestingly, what is the F that makes this maximum? Can we say something about it? So, in the Strickard's case, so when P is two, this is the, the estimate which we saw is called the Strickard's estimate for the wave equation. Okay. And it's a fundamental uh, estimate of 
dispersive PDEs. So surprisingly, in that case, we know how to maximize that ratio in some, in some cases. And precisely in these three cases here, yes, yes, and yes. So we know that in dimension three, so spatial dimension three means that we are in the physical space time, I mean, Koski space time. And on the two sheeted cone, and also on the one sheeted cone. So on the, the physical space time is the simplest one. Simplest, not, I mean, don't get me wrong, it's, it's the one that we know better. Because in that case, both on the two sheeted cone and on the one sheeted cone, we know explicitly a maximizer of that ratio, which is this very nice function here. So in the talk, in the, in the, in the title of the talk, I said exponentials rarely maximize, because this is the exponential I'll be talking about. In all this talk, this F star will always be this exponential here. And this exponential maximizes the inequality in the Strickard's case. So you see L2 here. Uh, Diogo, uh, in uh, in Diogo talk, this was Stein Thomas case. Usually, when it's the sphere, we call it Stein Thomas. When it's the cone or the parabola, we call it Strickard's for historical reasons, but it's essentially the same. Okay, so we know this. In some other cases, namely on the one sheeted cone, and also on the two sheeted cone, but only in odd dimensions, we know that this is a local maximizer. So local maximizer means that when you are close enough to F, for all F close enough to F star, and I didn't write it here, but you can also put symmetries of F star. So if you translate, for example, or dilate F star, or, or Lorentz transform F star, you, you, this all also holds, okay? So close to F star and its transformations, this holds, it's a local maximizer. But not in these cases here, because in, that, in those cases, F star is not a critical point. I will say exactly what critical point means in the next slide, but you can, if you know optimization, you can at least imagine what, what, what that's. And this is, so yes, is a, result, a seminal result of Foskey, 2007. I will talk about it in a moment. These no's are uh, my first contribution to this problem. This was actually part of my PhD thesis. And then the local, uh, I, I worked on the local problem with Felipe Gonsalves in 2019. Okay. And then this is a more recent result we have. We have with Diogo, Betsy Stobel, and James Torches, which, by the way, gives me the opportunity to say what the critical point is. And the critical point is just, so F star is a critical point if and only if the derivative is zero. What is the derivative? Of course, this is a function defined on a, 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 on a vector space, on LP. So the derivative is the directional derivative. For each directional, you take a direction, you take a derivative. If all derivatives are zero, then you are a critical point. That's a clearly a necessary condition for F star to be a maximizer. Nothing, nothing weird here. Okay, and recall that F star is this exponential. Now, what did we found with, uh, with Diogo Betts and James? We find that, first of all, we have existence of maximizers. So provided this ratio makes sense, which means that the estimate, the, the estimate holds, which is still a conjecture in some cases, but in those cases for which you already know that the estimate holds, it admits maximizers. However, the maximizer rarely is what we hoped for. Because it's a critical point if and only if P is true. And then here I am also only considering the one sheeted cone. On the two sheeted cone, even when P is true, sometimes you have something goes wrong in even dimensions. Okay. On the one sheeted cone, it's also always a critical point provided P is true. So this is uh, rarely maximized. This is exactly the same as uh, did Diogo mentioned this. Uh, this is exactly the same phenomenon as the parabola. 
If you take this ratio, but you change the mesh, instead of putting the Lorentz invariant mesh, you put here this, which ultimately is the same as what Hugo said, the projection mesh on the parabola. This is the natural mesh you put on the parabola. Okay. So if you, if, you, if, you take, if you do that, then you have the paraboloidal ex, uh, Fourier extension inequalities. And for those, you have existence of maximizers on the paraboloid, but maximizers rarely are of this form. Notice that this is the Gaussian, because on the support of this measure, we have the tau equals C squared. So in that case, exponential minus tau is exactly the Gaussian. So, So in, in the paraboloidal case, this is the Gaussian. Yes, this is null dimension. Okay, and, uh, and these are the results that I wanted to present. Now, I want to do a digression. This is, this is a basic fact. Of sharp, this is perhaps the most basic fact of sharp Fourier restriction theory. And um, I wanted to present it because it's, I, I, for two reasons, I, I think it's beautiful and uh, deserves to be better known. And also because I keep talking about this function here, exponential minus tau, but I, it's unclear where does this come from? So why this exponential tau? Well, where does it come from? I have an, an answer to this, but first let's see historically where it appeared first. And it appeared first in this paper, Fosky 2007, which Diogo also mentioned. This paper treats both the cone and the parabola. And in both, you have this function appear. Why? Let's see. So let's, put, let's consider the one-sheeted cone, this. So we have this mesh. Let's take dimension three, as I said, the physical dimension, right? Which is the, the only one where we know everything. And the case P equals two. So the three cards case, which is also the only one in which we can say, uh, we can say many things. Just now, uh, uh, so we are in space time. So the, a point is uh, time and space. And I write zeta to in, to, to, for, for compactness. So we want to maximize this integral here. Diogo mentioned this. Here we have an L4. Why L4? Because we are in our tree. So in, in the physical space-time, the right exponent here turns out to be four, which is very good because it's an even integer. And Diogo mentioned this. When you have an even integer, so this line is nothing. Here, I just expanded the integral, right? So this is L4 norm, so I have four copies of F. Then there is a Fourier transform, so there is an exponential. And then I'm integrating in this measure, which is the measure here, mu, four times, tensor product of mu four times, and then dt dx. dt dx because these are the variable of integration here. So this is nothing, but now I can integrate this exponential and it becomes a delta. This is, if, if, you, if, you, if you prefer, if, this is exactly the Planchard theory. Integral of exponential is delta. Bit. And slightly and waving, but it's very convenient. Okay. So here there's no exponential anymore. And this is because here we had a four, an even integer. Okay. So this is oops, sorry, this is very easy. But now this is the idea of Fosky. You can bound this integral using the inequality of Cauchy Schwarz, because here you have a giant measure which is positive. You see this, all this. Is a positive measure. This is just a scalar product of this function here. This is a function of two variables. 
with this function of two variables. So you can bound the scalar product with the square root of the norm. So you have the product of two square roots, but they turn out to be the same, it's quite easy. So in the end, this is bounded by this. You see, this is the measure that appears here. But now what happens is that only two variables are tied. The variable three and variable four, which we are integrating in, are free. There's nothing here. When you compute this, so, so when you use Fubini and you integrate out these two variables, what appears here is exactly the convolution. Because the convolution What is the convolution? Well, the convolution is, if you want to write it in terms of Dirac deltas, this is the convolution. And it's exactly what appears here with Say one, say two. And then this is the miracle. I, call, I don't believe in miracles. This is, there is a proof for this, but let's call it miracle because I'm not going to give the proof. <laughs> so let's pretend it's a miracle. This is a constant on its support. Diogo talked about this. We have seen pictures of this. And so you can take this out and you have now an inequality with explicit constant. And this constant is the sharp one. So this maximizes the ratio. Why? So here I have taken only the, so, so here you see there is only one inequality in this proof, only this one. So let's, let's forget about all the rest. Let's focus on the inequality. Is the inequality sharp? Yes. And why? Because this guy here, if you put this F star here, this is an identity. And why it is, is it an identity? This is the algebra. Put, sorry, put the exponential tau here. Okay, we are on the one-sheeted cone, so there's no absolute value. So we have just four taus. And then there is this big delta. But now this is the same trick as before. Tau three minus tau, uh, minus tau four is the same as tau one. So this term here, minus tau three minus tau four, is the same as minus tau one minus tau two. So this is this on the support of this measure. And this is exactly the square which appears here. So you see th this integrand is the same as this integrand. So this is an identity. Is it clear questions on this? And this is the reason why you see this exponential. Of course, I mean, and Diogo mentioned this, Diogo was talking about the functional equation. This is what he was talking about. Essentially, of course, you can say many more things, here, but this is the, the, the seed of all of that. So this is why you see these exponentials in Fosky's paper. But one thing I want to answer in this talk is, can it be that we have a more conceptual explanation for this? So this function here maximizes a fundamental inequality for the wave equation, the three cuts inequality. The maximizer should be a function that has some symmetry property or some important property related to the wave equation. Stronger than this, this is a technical explanation. And this, this is a very beautiful proof, but this is a technical explanation. So why do we see this? Okay. If we know how to answer this question, why do we see this exponential? Then maybe we can get at least some intuition for all the other results that we have, seen, we, we, that we have seen. So uh, exponential rarely maximize, 
why we expect exponentials to be maximizers in some cases and, all, and so on and so forth. Okay. And this, to achieve this, I need to introduce a classical tool of relativity theory, which is the Penrose map. Penrose is Sir Roger Penrose, a physicist, a the theoretical physicist. So Penrose introduces this kind of, this was his method to study space time. Yeah, we are in space time, right? As I said, R1 plus D is uh, space time. Notice that here I'm taking X and T, not Xi and Tau. Okay, so this is the physical space time. But, and I want to draw it here, but I have D plus one dimension, so I only take the radial coordinate. This is, uh, the, this is the radial coordinate, this is the time coordinate, and this grid here is space time. And Penrose said, if you do this change of variables here, you introduce a conformal time, this is how it's called, conformal time, big T, and instead of the radial coordinate R, you consider a angular radial coordinate theta. So this theta is the, uh, the uh, we are on the sphere and theta is the angle. So it's the, the length of this arc. So this is why I call it angular radial coordinates, polar coordinates on the sphere. So if you do this, you take these coordinates and you do this change of variables here without tangents, Arctangent, you know, the range of arctangent is compact. So you are compactifying this region here into that. Okay, this is the geometry. I, I, I made this in red, so you, you understand the horizontal lines are mapped into these lines, shaped like that. And you have a compact picture of the whole space-time here. Okay? So this is used to compactify space-time. Yes. So we have this uh, map of space time into is this uh, bounded region. And I, I like this picture because I, I was not expecting so a big lecture hall. So I, I wanted to make this into a physical cylinder, but nobody's going to see it. So I, I dropped it. But I mean, it's, it's a diamond. The range of this map is a diamond on a cylinder, right? because this is the angular coordinate on the sphere. And this is the conformal time, it's just a, a real coordinate. So this is a cylinder. And space time is mapped not into all cylinder, but only onto this region here, which is called the Penrose diamond. Okay. So the Penrose diamond is a picture of space time. This is very basic mathematical relativity theory. But why do we care about all this? Well, we do because it turns out that this map is the right tool to answer that question, which I, I, I have written here. Remember, I, I, was, I was saying, uh, is there a less technical explanation for the appearance of this? Yes. And the less technical explanation is this one. So, suppose you want, let, now, from now on, let me take the two-sheeted cone, just for simplicity, so I don't have to change into two-sheeted, one-sheeted. So, for now on, it's only two-sheeted cone. The fundamental manifold of the wave equation. What does it mean? It means that this extension operator here is exactly the solution to the wave equation. And this function f, function of, maybe it's better to call it a density because it's a function defined on the, on the manifold. So this density here, f, corresponds to the initial data of the wave equation. So there is a correspondence, I'm not going into this detail, but F is essentially the initial data of this. And if you do the Penrose transform, Penrose, of course, is a theoretical physicist. He was studying the wave equation ultimately. So his Penrose map comes with a transform. You can transform this equation into this equation here. 
You see, it's again a wave equation, but with the extra term coming essentially from the curvature of the sphere. And these two equations are the same up to the Penrose map. And if you do this, this F corresponds to the initial data, initial data of this equation here. So what is the, 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 the end of all this story? That we want to maximize this integral. Right? This is the LQ norm of the extension of the vector. But if you do the Penrose transform, you end up maximizing this integral, which is the LQ norm with the weight on this Penrose diamond. This is the Penrose diamond, remember. So we are not on the full cylinder, but on a diamond in the cylinder. And this F star, which was the object we are studying, if you do this, corresponds to the constant initial data. This is magic. Again, I don't believe in magic or miracles, but I like these words as key um, to catch attention. So this is something really remarkable. This exponential, which appeared out of the Cauchy-Schwarz uh, and the technical nice proof. If you instead look at it in the Penrose coordinates, it's the initial data that is constant. So, so initial data to the wave equation, you know, it's two functions, right? And uh, F star is the one that is one on the first component and zero on the second. So now we have a conceptual explanation for that. Because we want to maximize this. So we want to maximize this. It's the same. Notice here what happens when P is 2. P equals 2 means that this guy is not here. So we have just an integral which is, looks like it's rotational invariant. It's not exactly because we still have this domain. This domain is not rotational invariant. If you rotate the cylinder, uh, this is not symmetric. But still, at, if P is not two, this is definitely not rotational invariant. So why would you expect constant functions? Constant functions on the sphere are, are, are rotationally symmetric functions. Why would you expect these functions to maximize this? Indeed, they, they don't. And this is the content of the theorem we have, which we have with Diogo, Betsy, and James. If P is not two, this is not the right candidate for a maximizer. There is a maximizer, but it, it's not this one, this one. Why? Because the, the, the integral is not rotationally symmetric. So it's clearly not the right, the right one. However, when P is two, it can be, and indeed it is in the case of dimension three, we have seen Fosky. In dimension three, this is maximized by this initial data. So what's going on? How much time do I have left? Ah, great, I think I can finish. Great. Okay, so, Let's go further down. Let's explore a bit more this thing. Yeah, if you have any questions, it's a good time for questions. Yes, yes. I, I, the weight is, 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 of course, is known at this EC. It's just the Jacobian of the Penrose transform. I have written this in this way just because I don't want to attract too much attention. But the weight is this. I, I, I was going to write it later anyway. It's the sum of two cosines with this exponent. This is the weight. This is essentially the Jacobian of that map with arc tangents that I wrote, I wrote before. So the integral we are studying is this.
This is the integral. Okay. And it, you see it's integral on this diamond on the cylinder. Theta is the angular variable. So you see, this is not, if you rotate the sphere, this breaks down because you, you, here you are choosing the pole in the sphere. So if you rotate the sphere, this changes completely. So thank you for the question. It was a good one. So let's go uh, a bit more down the line and explore a bit what's going on. So um, I would like to at least explain what happens in these cases. So in, in, let's focus on the two, on the three cards case now, right? Which is also con computationally, it's simpler because there's no weight here. Let's say, try, let me try to give some ideas of what's going on in the Strickard case, because here we already seen some surprising phenomena. At least I, I thought it was, it was surprising that we have this parity of the dimension here entering the picture. So, yes, okay. So, by what we are saying, we need to maximize this integral, which is this one minus the weight, because the weight is not there. We want to maximize this integral. Capital U solves this PDE. This is the PDE that comes from the Penrose theory. And we are wondering whether F star, which is the solution to this PDE with constant initial data, maximizes this integral. Let's see what happens in dimension two and in dimension three. And this is what happens. In dimension three, this is a critical point. Of course, it must be because we have seen the proof of Fosky that in that case, this is even a maximizer. But in dimension two, that's not a critical point. And indeed, that, that proof of Fosky that we've seen before, it doesn't work in dimension two. So what's going on? So let's start with dimension three. Here, this is the nice case. This is the case where everything goes well. Everything works well here. So let's see what's going on. It happens that if you solve this PDE on this space here, we are, remember we are, we are on the cylinder. Which cylinder? the cylinder of dimension four. So it's a sphere on dimension three times R, right? Because we are in, the, in the Minkowski space time. If you do Penrose transform of Minkowski, you end up in a Penrose diamond inside this cylinder. So we are starting essentially now, we are starting this PDE. And this PDE satisfies this symmetry. If you translate in time, by pi, and you flip, you go on the antipodal point on the sphere, you, if you are the same, you only take a sign. And this is the proof. Of course, this, uh, I, 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 um, I like harmonic analysis, so this is the harmonic analytic proof. Uh, I, I remember I gave a talk in Lisbon uh, in front of uh, physicists, and they wanted to prove this in a different way. Of course, it's okay. <laughs> you can prove it directly by, via the PD. But we are doing harmonic analysis here. So I thought of presenting the harmonic analytic proof of that, which is, this is the solution to the PD. You see, this is just a functional calculus solution. So if you expand the data in spherical harmonics, expand u0 in the sum of spherical harmonics. Spherical harmonics means eigenfunctions eigen of the Laplacian, of the spherical Laplacian. This is the, the, the eigenvalue because we are in S3. The two is three minus one. And the spherical harmonics are essentially homogeneous polynomial. The spherical harmonics are homogeneous harmonic polynomials. So in particular, they are homogeneous polynomials of degree L. If I do minus X here, I take a sign, a sign of minus one. So when I 
when I write the solution in spherical harmonics, this is what I have, a sum of cosines. And when you translate time by pi, the, the, the cosine takes a minus one to the L plus one. This takes this. And the YL takes a minus one to the N. So in the end, you get a, a net minus here. Okay, so I, I, I'm going with, this is very easy, but I'm doing it with detail because this is really the key point. Notice that this really, it's a really an algebraic fact that is really dependent on the dimension on the sphere. If you change S3, you put here S2, this eigenvalue changes, and, and so you don't have this algebra, this very nice algebra here. Also, if you change here this, the, the coefficient in front of you, so instead of one here, you have another number, again, you destroy the algebra. So this is really a, a delicate mechanism that is destroyed if you change either the dimension or the, or the coefficient here, okay? And this is key. So by the way, what I was saying is, if you, if you do this in dimension two, this fails because you have, you have changed both the dimension and the coefficient. And for example, here you, here you have, you can solve this PDE, this is very easy, and you get a cosine a half. Before we had the cosine, now we have half cosines. So this is, this, it doesn't work here in dimension two. But in dimension three, it does. And it allows us to remove that thing. Remember, we have, we have, yes, here we have. We are studying these integrals on the Penrose diamond. What is the Penrose diamond? Is this region of the, the space-time, compact space-time, is this kind of triangle. But now, because of that symmetry, this integral is, is essentially up to this one half. This integral is the integral of the full cylinder. This is the cylinder, right? This, this rectangle represents the cylinder. So this now is rotational invariant. So this is what's going on. In odd space dimension, the inter we, we are really trying to maximize a rotationally symmetric integral. And so it's reasonable to expect that the maximizer is constant, at least it's constant at initial time. No, no, in other dimensions, this, this is the same. You can pick a different, uh, so for example, in dimension five, you pick a plus one. It's exactly the same formula, but with a plus. In dimension seven, it's again a minus. A minus. Dimension nine is a plus, and so on and so forth. In even, no. In even, there's nothing. No, as far as I, as far as I know, no. Or maybe yes, but you need pi, because you need, this is pi. And this is fixed. This is general for all dimension. This picture is the same in all dimension. So you always have pi. So you really need this symmetry with pi. Maybe you have, I, I don't know, maybe you have with pi halves. Good, but you can't do anything with that because pi halves is too small. Uh, is it clear? Because you see, you need pi, why? Because you want to, you are integrating on this triangle. Now, this triangle, but okay, if you translate this area here by pi, it goes up. Then you flip pi minus theta, uh, pi minus theta is flipping, right? It's the antipodal map on the sphere. So you flip and it, it goes into A tilde. So the integral over A is the same as the integral over A tilde. And the same here, the integral of a b tilde is the integral of a b. And so in the end, the integral is half the integral on the whole cylinder. Okay. So this is the key fact. 
And once you have this, okay, this slide is a bit more technical. I don't know if it's so interesting, but I wanted to finish the proof. Uh, so, okay, again, we are still in the nice case. This is the case where everything goes well. We know, we already know by Foskey that this is the global maximizer. We want to prove that it's a critical point to, to see where things can go wrong when you do other dimensions or other exponents. And so here, here we are. We, we want to maximize this integral here. So we take a, a, a derivative. This is what I'm doing. I'm taking a derivative of this integral in a, a direction orthogonal to what I, uh, to, 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 to my maximizer. And I claim that if I do so, this is uh, zero to main order. So this is, this is just a reformulation of the fact that, uh, that F star is a critical point. I'm just saying that the derivative is zero in an orthogonal direction. And uh, yeah, okay. Nothing, nothing too special. What, now, why is this true? Yes, because, okay, we do per rows. We, we have seen that now we have this PDE. So this integral here now turns into, so this difference here turns into this. This is just per rows. And this two comes from, there was a one half here. So the one half goes here. So now this is what I'm studying. I expand. And this is the integral I get. So I am a critical point if this integral is zero. The cosine comes from the fact that I'm solving this PDE with constant initial limit cosine to the cube. And this integral is zero. Why? Because this is the solution to this PDE with constant initial data. Uh, so, sorry, all, with initial data that are orthogonal to constants. But if you are orthogonal to constant at time zero, you are orthogonal to constant at all times. Again, you can prove this in several, in several ways. I, I like to prove this using harmonic analysis. Uh, remember, this is, if you expand this in spherical harmonics, this is orthogonal to constant. So the zeroth or the, the zeroth term in the spherical harmonic expansion is zero. And so it remains zero at all times. And this integral identically vanishes. So this is zero. And this means exactly that it's a critical. Now, this is a bit more technical, but you see, I need here that this is a Cartesian. I need the rotational invariance because otherwise I don't have symmetry here. If the integral is posed, this is a cylinder, right? If instead of the cylinder here, I have something weird, then I cannot, say, I cannot put this integral inside. I don't have this freedom to do all these transformations so elegantly. So when dimension is even, I can't do this. When P is not two, I have this weight here. This weight is going to destroy this completely. This is really delicate. And let's, this is the final slide. Summary. So the, 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 the content of my talk is, I, I, I say that the Penrose transform is the right tool to at least give a conceptual explanation of the importance of this function here for the maximization of the uh, conical extension operator. Why? Because in up to the Penrose transform, this turns into the solution to the wave to a certain wave equation with constant initial data on the sphere. And if you study this when P is not two, you get the integral with the weight, which has no rotational, which has smaller rotational symmetries. So this is not a critical point. When P is two, but dimension is even, 
you end up with the integral of a, a, a domain that has a weird shape. So you are also not rotationally symmetric. And so you are also not a critical. When P is due to and dimension is odd, that's the, when all the stars align, and you get this integral here, in which case this is a critical point. But we still don't know if it's a maximizer. We only know that this is a maximizer when D is three. When D is five or seven and so on, we know it's a local maximizer. But I still don't know how to prove. I believe it's a global maximizer, but I don't know how to prove it. I'm done. Thank you very much. <laughs>